Hey, good morning and uh, welcome to Worship at Shades. Uh, this is a little bit different uh, service. Uh, as you know, that uh, because of the snow and ice conditions that we've had in our city, uh, we, were, we had to uh, cancel our services. And uh, so uh, we though made the decision that uh, we felt at least one of us or a couple of us could make our way up here and, um, and we still wanted to be able to share uh, a gospel message with you on this Sunday morning. And so we've invited our members to uh, live stream this service. Uh, for many of you, this may be the first time you've ever tried our live stream and I hope that you enjoy it, but I hope you don't enjoy it too much. Uh, we still want you to be here and to be in the, in the services, but live stream is provided for, uh, for those that are not able to be here because of illness or travel or whatever else. And uh, we're glad that today we can use this medium to be able to have a time of worship with you. Uh, this is, a, like I said, a different type of service. Uh, number one, the worship center is empty, and so I'm just speaking to you in the camera. Uh, number two is uh, I got to park in senior adult parking. Uh, I never get that opportunity, and so it was a lot of fun this morning to park that close to the building. So this morning, uh, I hope that you've got a Bible with you, and I'll give you just a moment to, to get your Bible, and uh, I'd like for you to open it to 1 Kings chapter 13, 1 Kings chapter 13. I, I didn't really know if I had a title for this message. When I read 1 Kings 13, I just wrote next to it, Scary Chapter. And um, if I can give you a little bit of a background on this, uh, when we took our church through the 50 days of prayer and fasting, uh, I was going through a time, I was reading through the Bible, and I came to this chapter, 1 Kings 13, and there was an account there that took place that apparently I'd never seen before, never thought about. And as I read it, uh, it was kind of scary. And so I wrote notes from it, and it has just been sitting for about a month and a half of, um, of just things that I would go back over and take a look at it and said, you know, one day I need to preach off this passage. Well, uh, this Sunday, we were scheduled to do a state of the church and a celebration for our chapters. It's not much of a celebration when you're by yourself. So I said, let's take that and move it to next week. And so next Sunday, the 15th, uh, it will be our time where we celebrate uh, what God has done in 2016, kind of give you a state of the church message, and at the same time celebrate uh, the conclusion of our chapters campaign. And uh, that was it's going to be an exciting Sunday uh, next Sunday. So I hope you'll come and you'll be with us. But this Sunday, I want us to focus on 1 Kings uh, chapter 13. If you went back a chapter before in chapter 12, what you would see is, uh, if I can set the historical precedence, it started out with King Solomon. Solomon had a great reign, and it was one of the uh, high times in Israel. And they had uh, a lot of success, a lot of building, a lot of uh, financial blessings on them. But as Solomon stepped away, he chose his son, Rehoboam, uh, to be the leader, to be the new king. Well, when Rehoboam became the king, the people came to him and they said, listen, your father Solomon, he got a lot done, but he worked us hard. He was like a slave master to us, and the yoke was so heavy on us. What we would appeal to you is, would you lessen that load on us, and we will follow you? And he said, well, give me three days, and I'll get back with you. So we met with the, what they called kind of the old men, the people, the counselors who had worked with Solomon. And he said, so what do you think I should do? And they, knowing Solomon, came and told him, they said, you know what you need to do? If you would speak kindly to those people and you would tell them that you will be a servant leader, they will follow you forever. Sound like pretty good advice. But then he went to the guys he grew up with, the buddies, that, that the, kind of the, the young up-and-comer guys. And so when he got with them, he says, guys, what do you think I should do? And they said, no, you shouldn't do what those guys said. You should be tougher than your dad. You should set your own mark. And you should tell those people that, you know what? You know, you, my dad gave you a yoke. I'm going to make the yoke even harder for you. And he even told him, says, you tell them that my little finger is bigger than my father's thigh. Now, I don't know what that meant, but uh, what it was trying to say was, you know, you thought my dad was really something. I'm even better, and I'm going to be better. And they said, this is what you need to do. So, going against the counsel of those who really had more wisdom, he went and he said um, to the people, nope, it's going to be tougher. It's going to be harder, and this is what I'm going to do. 
Well, the people rebelled. And when the people rebelled, it split the kingdom. And the nation of Israel, which had 12 tribes, now all of a sudden had 10 tribes, which was called Israel. They split off. And then two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, that stayed over here and were with Rehoboam. So now you've got a split kingdom. So who's going to be the king of Israel? Well, there's a man that came along by the name of Jeroboam. Now, Jeroboam, Rehoboam sound a lot alike, but they're, they're not related. So Jeroboam is now the king of Israel. But what he did was that he wanted to set things different. He says, we don't need to go to Jerusalem, which is where Judah is. We don't want to go to Jerusalem to worship. So he set up two other places for worship, one in the south called Bethel, one in the north called Dan. But not only did he set those places for worship, but he began to build uh, altars to other idols, and he had golden calves that he had put in each one of them. So not only had he changed the place of worship, he was even changing the God in which they were worshiping. And so these were some difficult times in Israel, and idolatry was beginning to spread through there. And then you come to chapter 13 of 1 Kings. And so in 1 Kings 13, it is the story of a man who is a prophet who we don't even know what his name is. And so I want to read through this, walk through this story, and, um, and let's take some insights from what God is trying to teach us even through this particular account. It says, "Then behold, a man of God came out of Judah by the word of the Lord to Bethel. And Jeroboam was standing by the altar to make offerings. Okay, so, so just uh, kind of paint the picture here. If you've got Judah's here, Bethel's just right here, a little bit north. He came out of Judah and went to Bethel. He came to Israel. Israel and, and, and Judah weren't getting along really well. But yet God told him, I want you to go from a safe place to a little bit more dangerous place. And as you get there, he said, I want you to go to Bethel. I want you to go to where the altar is. I want you to go where the king of Israel, the most powerful man of Israel, I want you to go where he is, and then I want you to confront him. And it says, Jeroboam was standing by the altar to make offerings. And the man, the prophet, he cried against the altar by the word of the Lord, and he said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord, behold, a son shall be born to the house of David, Josiah by name. And he shall sacrifice on you the priest of the high places who make offerings on you, and human bones shall be burned on you. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign that the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be torn down, and the ashes that are on it shall be poured out. This prophet, he goes up to the most powerful man, and he goes to this most powerful man of Israel, the king, and he looks at him and he says, You're getting ready to sacrifice on this altar? Let me just talk to this altar. One day, there will be another king that will be born out of Judah. His name will be Josiah. And he is going to come and he is going to take the priest, these false priests that are sacrificed, and he's going to sacrifice them and burn them on these particular altars. That's, that's not a happy thing uh, for Jeroboam to hear. And then he said, and I'm going to give a sign to you, and that is that, uh, that these whole altars are going to be torn down and, and put to put to ash. So he makes this bold claim as to what is getting ready to happen. And just as an aside, guess what? About 300 years later, there is a king. His name is Josiah. And if you look in 2 Kings chapter 23, he does exactly what this prophet said he would do. And, uh, and he did everything that was said there in Bethel. But he makes this prophecy here. Well, Jeroboam doesn't like that at all. And he says in verse, uh, in verse 4, And when the king heard the saying of the man of God, which he cried against the altar at Bethel, Jeroboam stretched out his hand from the altar, saying, Seize him. So he was surrounded by all of his guys, and he says, I want you to seize him. I want you to arrest him. But look what happened. And it says, And his hand, which he stretched out against him, dried up so that he could not draw it back to himself. So even as he stretches his hand out, all of a sudden it begins to wither up and dry up, and he can't even bring it back into itself. And then it says, and the altar also was torn down, and the ashes were poured out from the altar according to the sign that the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. Whoa! So what happened is, is that as soon as he reaches out his hand and says, you need to seize this man, his hand withers up. Then he looks over at the altar, and God himself destroys this altar, splits everything in two, just like the prophet said was going to happen. Well, this 
it kind of got his attention. Because it then says in, uh, in uh, verse 6, And the king said to the man of God, Entreat now the favor of the Lord your God, and pray for me that my hand may be restored to me. Now just give you an idea how far they had gotten away from God. He says, Entreat the Lord your God. It wasn't even his God. And he says, Listen, you prophet that have come from Judah, you must be serving some powerful God. He says, The Lord your God. So will you entreat him to find favor on me? And to restore my hand. And then it says, And the man of God entreated the Lord, and the king's hand was restored to him and became as it was before. And so the king said to the man of God, I want you to come home with me and refresh yourself, and I will give you a reward. So, I mean, he, you know, he has gone from, I was going to arrest you, to now all of a sudden I've asked you to, to be an intercessor of prayer for me, to where now he says, I want you to come to my house and I want to give you a, a reward. But look at the response of this prophet. And the man of God said to the king, if you give me half your house, I will not go in with you. And I will not eat bread or drink water in this place. And listen to verse 9. For so was it commanded me. By the word of the Lord saying, you shall neither eat bread nor drink water nor return by the way that you came. And so he went another way and did not return by the way that he came to Bethel. Here's what God told him. I want you to go. I want you to go to Bethel and I've got something for you to do. When you do it, I don't want you to stick around. I don't want you to eat anything. I don't want you to drink anything. Don't you stop off at, at a drive through uh, I don't want you to do anything. I want you to just come right back home. That's all you got to do. And commentators wonder why. Maybe the, the influences there were so bad that God says, I don't want you to be surrounded by those influences. I don't want you to, uh, uh, to, to get connected with any of the adultery that's going on. You just go there and you come back. Is that clear? Don't eat anything. Don't drink anything. It's not that long of a journey. And then I want you to come back over here. And so when the king himself offered an opportunity to give him a reward, bring him to his house, the response was, this is what God told me to do. Don't eat anything, don't drink anything, come in, go out, get her done, get on back home. And that's exactly what he did, and go a different way from Bethel. Well, that just sounds, sounds incredible. And when you sit there and you think about it, for this particular um, prophet, he doesn't get any better than this. If you're called to be a prophet, how good is this? You get called to go and um, go to a land where people are, uh, are worshiping other idols. You get to stand before the main man, the king, and give a word of judgment and prophecy from God himself. And then to see right there that the sign that God said you was going to happen, it happened. And then to see that God protected you when they tried to arrest you, God stepped in front of him and withered the arm. And then when you came and you entreated the holy God of this universe, our creator God, and said, will you restore this man's hand? God answered your prayer, restored his hand. It doesn't get any better than that. I mean, that's when you say, as a prophet, this is it. There are other prophets that have come and gone, and they've never been able to experience what he experienced. What a great day. And when was asked to stick around for a reward, his response was, hey, God told me to do A, B, and C. I'm doing A, B, and C. This is a great story. And I wish it had ended right there. It would have been great if it ended right there, but, but you see now there's more to it. And when you get to verse 11, it says, now an old prophet lived in Bethel. And his sons came and told him all that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. And they also told to their father the words that he had spoken to the king. So he's got some sons who were over there, and either they were a part of seeing what took place, or word had already begun to spread about what had happened. I mean, it's not often that a prophet from Judah is going to come and get in the face of the king of Israel, and then to have all that miraculous stuff take place. And so word was spreading like crazy. And so he tells his, they tell their dad exactly what happened. And it says they told him all the words. So when they told him all the words, that means that they told him that the prophet said, I'm not going to eat, I'm not going to drink, I'm just heading back home. But look what this old prophet did. In verse 12, it says, And their father said to them, Which way did he go? 
And his son showed him the way that the man of God who came from Judah had gone. And he said to his son, saddle the donkey for me. So he saddled the donkey for him and he mounted it. And he went after the man of God and he found him sitting under an oak. And he said to him, are you the man of God who came from Judah? And he said, I am. And then he said to him, come home with me and eat bread. What? Come home with me and eat bread. Now, he knew the words that this prophet had said. I'm not supposed to eat anything, drink anything, and just go straight home. He says, why don't you come home with me? And I want you to come and I want you to to eat bread. Now, why is he doing this? You you know, when you first look at this, your question is, what's up with this? Why are you even going over there? Well, you know, I just came and started thinking about this is that all of a sudden, people are talking about this famous prophet from Judah. And probably the question is going to be, well, we got a prophet here. You know, the old guy right there down the street. He's just down the street here in Bethel. Why did God have to send someone from Judah to come and, and get in front of our king when we got a guy right here? Maybe there's some ego there. Maybe he felt that he was, um, uh, you know, people were going to be talking on that. So uh, I've got to befriend this guy. Maybe he wanted to call this guy and have him come to his house because as people talked about how great he was, then all of a sudden he could maybe say, hey, yeah, I know him. Yeah, we're really tight. Yeah, we, we, you know, we share sermons. Uh, we talk each other about how to sacrifice lambs and bulls, and, and uh, we pick up some pointers from each other. Uh, good buddy of mine. So every time conversation came about, you remember that story when the guy from Judah came? He said, yeah, good friend of mine. I had him in my house. We spent some good time together. So whatever it was, it was some type of selfish reasons that he wanted to come and get this man to come into his house. And see, some of you may say, well, Danny, maybe you just wanted to hang out with him and talk to him. That's a, that, that would make sense. Then what he should have done is said, hey, can I walk with you? And as you began to travel back to, um, uh, back to Judah, I'll walk with you part of the way. And I'd love for you to talk to me. and Let's talk about exactly what happened. Because that would be in keeping. God didn't say anything about not talking to anyone. He just says, don't eat, don't drink, don't stop. Just head on back home. But yet this man said, I don't want you to come to my house. Well, he says it, and look at the response. And he comes back in, uh, in verse 16. And this prophet in Judah said, I may not return with you or go in with you, neither will I eat bread nor drink water with you in this place. For it was said to me by the word of the Lord, you shall neither eat bread nor drink water there nor return by the way that you came. So what did he do? He came and he said the exact same thing he had said to the king. And he's staying on course. All right? Now, this is when I wish the story had ended, but it didn't. Because in verse 18, and he said to him, This is the old prophet. He says, I also am a prophet as you are. And an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord saying, bring him back with you into your house that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied to him. So the old prophet pulls out a word of the Lord card and he says, well, you know, I know what you're saying there, but, um, you know, an angel of the Lord told me that, uh, that you're supposed to come and be refreshed at my house. So what does the man do? Well, he's got to consider this a little bit. Uh, first of all, it's an old prophet, so you would think he's got a lot of experience. Uh, he is claiming that I got a, he got a word from the Lord. Uh, he's not looking for anything special. He's just there wanting to try to help me and uh, give me something to eat and someplace to rest before I head back. So, you know, I can, I can look at all of that and think, well, maybe that's, that, that's an okay idea. But then I've got the word of the Lord that has told me what I'm supposed to do. But verse 19 says, so he went back with him and he ate bread in his house and drank water. He went back to that man's house, and he did exactly what God had told him not to do. Now, it was a duty of the man, this man of God, to resist it. 
He had a word from the Lord, and he had a word from the Lord to guide his actions, and he should receive no other word except through a dramatic or direct confrontation by the Holy Spirit. God had told him. God had not come back and given him a different word. He's got an old prophet over here who says, the word of the Lord has come to me and has said that uh, you need to come and uh, be with me. Mm. Direct contradiction with what God had told him. And so he makes that decision and he goes. And he goes to his house. And in the midst of eating the food, all of a sudden, God comes and gives a true word to this old prophet. In verse 20 it says, And as they sat at the table, the word of the Lord came to the prophet who had brought him back. And he cried to the man of God who came from Judah. So God gives a word to this old prophet and he cries out to this guest in his house. He says, Thus says the Lord, Because you have disobeyed the word of the Lord and have not kept the command of the Lord that the Lord your God commanded you, but you have come back and have eaten bread and drunk water in the place of which he said to you, eat no bread, drink no water, your body shall not come to the tomb of your fathers. God gave a word to the old prophet to tell this prophet from Judah, and he said, in essence, you will have a violent death and you will not be buried back in Judah with your family. And it was, it was counted during that day a disgrace not to be buried where your family was. And so not only was there going to be a violent death, but there was going to be disgrace on him because he would be buried somewhere else. And that's the word that he gave. So what happened? Well, in verse 23, after he had eaten bread and drunk, he saddled the donkey for the prophet whom he had brought back. And as he went away, a lion met him on the road and killed him, and his body was thrown in the road, and the donkey stood beside it. And the lion also stood beside the body. And behold, men passed by, and they saw the body thrown in the road, and the lion standing by the body. And they came, and they told it in the city where the old prophet lived. So what happened was this man, he got on the donkey, a lion came out and he killed him. But to show that it was, uh, it, was, it was the judgment of God and nothing else, the lion stayed over the body, he didn't devour the body, and the donkey stayed right there too. Now, if you know much about lions and donkeys, lions would eat a donkey pretty quick. So that didn't take place. And so every person that passed by could see that it was a judgment of God that had taken place on here. Now, I've got to tell you, you know, as I, as I read through this, I got a little angry. First of all, I was really angry at the old prophet for misleading this man and sending him over here to his house. And then when the, by misleading him, he led to his death. And then I was kind of upset at God because I said, you know, you got an idolatrous king over here who has led your people uh, completely away from you, and yet he's kind of getting a pass over here. And this old prophet over here, seems like he's getting a pass. And the prophet who was taking a chance coming from Judah into uh, Israel, who made this stand for you, who less than 24 hours ago uh, was used by you in a mighty way, now all of a sudden, because he made that bad decision, he is, he's dead, and these other guys are still alive. I don't have an answer. One thing I do know is that the Bible constantly talks away about how God's ways are higher than our ways. And how God says that there will be judgment at the end of time. And that everyone will be judged for the things that they've done. And it also is said that though we see things dimly now, we will see things clearly when we're in his presence. And we'll begin to understand the perspective, uh, the perspective of God. But that is what happened. That's what happened in the story. But let me give you the rest of the story. And that is at the very end, it says in verse 26, And when the prophet who had brought him back from the way heard of it, when word got back to him, he said, that's who that prophet was. He said, it's the man of God who disobeyed the word of the Lord. Therefore, the Lord has given him to the lion, which has torn him and killed him, according to the word that the Lord spoke to him. And so he said to his son, saddle that donkey for me. And so he saddled it, and he went. He found the body that was thrown in the road, and the donkey and the lion standing beside the body. And the lion had not eaten the body or torn the donkey. 
And the prophet took up the body of the man of God and he laid it on the donkey, brought it back to the city to mourn and to bury him. And what you will see is that this man, the mistakes that he made, which I believe cost this man his life, he then began to bring as much honor as possible to this prophet of Judah. I mean, he stepped in. There's a lion standing right there. And yet he steps up and grabs this man's body, carries it back, and he says there's mourning over him. And he says, alas, my brother. And after he had buried him, he then buried him. He then said to his sons, when I die, bury me in the grave in which the man of God is buried. Lay my bones beside his bones. Why? For the saying that he called out by the word of the Lord against the altar in Bethel and against all the houses of the high places that are in the cities of Samaria shall surely come to pass. And he said, this is truly a man of God. I saw what he did. I heard what he did uh, there to Jeroboam. And then he made a prophecy that one day is going to come true. And so when I die, just bury me next to him. And he says, I want to give as much honor to this man as possible. You see, this old prophet has to live with those consequences every day. You know the big story has to be about this prophet from Judah and how he got in the face of King Jeroboam. And whenever people talk about that, there has to be some guilt that comes into the heart of this old prophet knowing because of his selfishness, he caused this man's death. But my hope is that a lesson was learned by this old prophet and that he was restored to usefulness. You just see some evidences of the fact that he was mourning for him and he understood the greatness of him. And you're hoping that even through this, that there could be greatness that could come back in his life. So Daniel, what do we get from from all of of this chapter? And uh, why is this kind of a scary chapter? Well, some things that we pull from this real quickly are, first of all, is that God's commands are clear. God's commands are clear. And when we obey God's commands and we follow his ways, he will do supernatural things through us. Wasn't that amazing that this prophet who has no name listened to what God told him to do, and though it may have seemed crazy, may have seemed dangerous, he went to Israel, got in front of the king, confronted him with a word of God, gave him a word of prophecy. In the midst of that, God did an amazing protection of him, a supernatural protection of him, and then uh, did a supernatural sign by destroying the altar. And all of a sudden, there was this time where he was the voice of God. Man, it doesn't get any better than that. And so God's commands are clear. And when God commands you to do something, when you read God's word and you see the things he lays out for us, we need to follow those. And as we follow those, then God will use us. He'll use us to be that shining light. No, you may not be the one that, 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 that preaches down to where a, and restores someone's arm or an altar is destroyed. But by you obeying the commands of God, as you walk according to his obedience, you will be that light. You will be that influence in other people's lives that can change their lives for eternity. So always remember, God's commands are clear. Number two is God does not contradict himself. God does not contradict himself. And so when you get a word of Scripture, and this is saying, this is what God tells me to do. Can I just let you know, you need to beware of the person who comes to you and says, I've got a word from the Lord. Now, I'm a pastor. I get this. I get this uh, probably more often than anyone else. When I was in the business world, I don't think anybody came up to me with a word from the Lord. Once I became a pastor, I'm inundated with people who all of a sudden have got a word from the Lord, all right? Now, there's some of you out there, you say, Pastor, I came up to you sometime, and I told you I had a word from the Lord. I understand that, and you did, and I appreciate that, okay? And that's good, and there is some truth where there are some times. But if I can just remind you, just because someone plays the I got a word from the Lord card or I had a vision in the middle of the night, you need to always go back to Scripture and you need to compare it to what God's Word says. God does not contradict himself. And if somebody's coming to you and says, I've got a word from the Lord that you're supposed to do this or this or whatever, and it goes against what God has clearly shown you and what God has, has uh, shown in Scripture, then you just need to walk away from it. I want you to always think about this old, this prophet in Judah 
He knew exactly what he was supposed to do. And when asked, he stood by it. When the king said, I want you to come here, he says, no, I've got to stay with what God's called me to do. When the old prophet asked him, he says, no, i got to do what God's called me to do. Then all of a sudden, he slid in this little card of the word of the Lord, told me this or that, and then he caved. And he said, well, maybe on there. I read in a commentary, it made a statement, it says this, God's people are more in danger of being drawn from their duty by the plausible pretenses of divinity and sanctity than by external inducements. Therefore, we need to be aware of false prophets and not believe every spirit. Number three is this. We are not to refine his commands with our logic. We are not to refine his commands with our logic. Whenever we take a command of God and we begin to put our logic to it and try to change that command, we are saying, I am wiser than God. You see, God has said, this is what is supposed to happen. This is what I'm supposed to do. That doesn't seem logical. So then I put my logic to it, and when I put my logic to it, all of a sudden I'm saying, you know, really I'm smarter than God is. No, we are not to refine his commands. Deuteronomy 5.32. You know, the book of Deuteronomy is just an incredible book. It is Moses talking to the children of Israel before they go into the promised land. And it's all about obedience and God's commands. And in Deuteronomy 5.32, this is what he says. You shall be careful, therefore, to do as the Lord your God has commanded you. You shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. Do as the Lord your God has commanded you. Listen, folks, we have got God's word. This is why during this year I encourage you to study this, read it, learn it, drink it in, meditate on it, and learn it. It will give you the direction that you need for life. And his commands uh, will always be true, and his teachings will always be true. We don't need to refine them with our logic. And number four, we know this. And that is disobedience has consequences. Disobedience has consequences. It's just, it's, It's just how God has set it up and that he loves us. He's created this world. He's got a purpose for us. He's got a direction for us. And he's given us a roadmap here in his word. This is how you are are to live. And when we go against that, then we will see certain kinds of death. We will see the death of a marriage. We could see the death of a friendship. We could see the death of a job, the death of a career. We could see the death and the loss of influence. All of these things can be lost because we decide that we want to go a different way than from what God has said. This chapter is scary because for that prophet, he lost his life because of that disobedience. For most of us, it may not be a loss of life, but it would be a loss of these other things that I've already talked about. And what God desires is the best for us and desires for us to stay with his word. But we understand that disobedience has consequences. But then the very last thing that I want you to think about on this snowy, icy day here in Birmingham is that we all have a little old prophet in us. So be careful. We all have a little bit of old prophet in us. We got a little bit of old prophet in us where we want people to do things for our selfish benefit. And so as an old prophet, you need to be careful. We need to always be checking our motives. So before we come to someone and and, uh, give advice or direction for them to take, we need to check our motives and say, is this of God or is this of me? Am I wanting this from a selfish standpoint for you to do this? You should only give advice to someone after you've been praying and you get a clear word from the Lord. You know, there are times where... uh, where people are taking some bold stands for God. And maybe you're not real comfortable with that. And so you may be that old prophet to come and say, you know, I think God's really impressed on my heart that you're not supposed to do this or not supposed to do that. When actually you didn't really get a word from the Lord, it's just your own desires. And and it's kind of more what you want on there. We've all got a little bit of old prophet in us. And so when we read this chapter, we think about 1 Kings 13. It's a little scary because we've all got a little bit of old prophet in us. And there could be a tendency for us 
to give advice, direction, and play this, I got a word from the Lord, I'm feeling deep in my spirit, this is what God is telling me, when actually God didn't tell us that. It's more of selfish desires. And if I could take it down another level, uh, as an older individual, for thus, us who are older, uh, don't think just because we're older that we can dispense wisdom without seeking God. Wisdom doesn't just come from experience. Wisdom comes from God. Proverbs 2.6 says, For the Lord gives wisdom, and from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. So, uh, so for us that are older, us as senior adults, that when we have an opportunity to um, share wisdom with others, let's make sure that we get it first from God, and then we can share with others and not just have that old prophet in us that may have selfish motives and desires. And that's a challenge because I'm, I'm there. As we get older, sometimes we think that we can just share these things, but let's make sure, Proverbs 2, 6, for the Lord is the one that gives wisdom. I think 1 Kings 13 is a scary chapter because it's, the, it's a no-name person who God used in amazing ways to have the greatest day of his life, to make the greatest accomplishments that he's ever made in all of his career. And yet in that same day, because of a bad decision that he made, he lost his life. And um, it just lets us know that there are consequences to our disobedience. And, um, and it's kind of a sobering chapter to say, even when God is using you in some incredible ways, you want to stay that course. Stay the course that he has set for you. But in one sense, it's also an exciting chapter to know that a man with no name, he's never, he's never been given a name here in Scripture, is one who did something so powerful for God that they were talking about here that people will continue to talk about him. People in Bethel will continue to talk about what this guy did. And when they talk about what he did, I'm pretty certain that it will not just be him, it will be what the Lord did. Because the Lord is the one that withered the hand. The Lord is the one that broke the altar. The Lord is the one that restored the hand of that king. And it was a time when God moved in an amazing way. And God used a guy who was just a no-name prophet. So as we move into this year, may we take these thoughts from 1 Kings 13 and understanding that, that God's commands are clear, okay? And that he doesn't contradict himself and that we don't need to refine his commands. We just need to believe and follow through with them. And when we do, God can use us to do some amazing and some incredible things. Let me lead us in a word of prayer as we close our time out today. Father, we are so thankful for uh, your word and Lord, there are some things that are placed in your word that, um, that we don't really fully understand. And we can read them and your Holy Spirit gives us new insights every time. But yet, Lord, don't help us not to miss the things that jump out at us in your word. And, uh, and the clarity of your commands and the fact that you never do contradict yourself. And so, Father, I pray that those that are watching this through live stream, that, that today it would be a day that they would take introspection of their own life and make a commitment to say, God, I want to follow your commands. I want to go the direction that you've called me to go. And then, Lord, I pray for all of us who are in positions to be kind of quote, unquote, old prophets to where people may come for advice and for wisdom and for guidance and direction. And, and whether that puts us, and whether we're 30 years old or whether we're 80 years old, if we're in that position, may we have uh, pure motives. May we realize that all wisdom comes from you. And may we be challenged to spend even more time in your word so that we will be better prepared to be used by you to influence others with the gospel of Jesus Christ and to be able to give guidance and direction. Thank you, Father, for it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.